Hi everybody, my name is Hassan Savran. Welcome to Data Platform Virtual Summit 2021. I'm going to speak uh, about Azure SQL Edge uh, in this presentation, and we are going to cover a lot of other technologies uh, because we have to kind of cover them so you can actually install the SQL Edge. There are some steps that you need to know. We will start with the you know IoT history. We will kind of try to figure out where IoT is going, and after we kind of define the IoT, we will cover other uh, technologies that you might need to know to actually install the SQL Edge. Uh, those are the Azure IoT Hub, and we need to figure out what Edge computing is. And now from that point, you know we are going to go to SQL Edge, and I'm going to show you step by step uh, how to install the SQL Edge. So I guess let's start it, and I'm excited. I hope everybody's going to learn something new today. Uh, before we, I guess, jump into the presentation, I would like to talk about myself a little bit. And my name is Hassan Sabran. I am a Microsoft Data Platform MVP. This is my third year. And I'm from Cleveland, Ohio, United States. And currently, I have been working with Progressive Insurance, and I'm a business intelligence manager there. Uh, I have a great web development uh, experience. And in my eight, last eight years, I have been in mostly in the business intelligence uh, department. And I had a chance to uh, work with all kind of data and databases and servers. Uh, you can follow me from any of the links that you see here. If you will have any questions, I would like to answer them today or maybe later from any of those platforms. And check my blog too. There are some you know good stuff out there. I like to share all kind of stuff out there. Uh, SQL Server, Cosmos DB, front end. I have something for everybody. So you might find something uh, interesting out there. Check it out. All right, so let's start our uh, presentations with the history. Well, IoT actually, uh, believe it or not, is not really that new, and it came up like many new, many great things uh, in our life. It was from the 1980s and 1990s, and in that time, the idea came, and people actually called that rather than IoT, they called connected uh, devices. It was a great idea, but the problem was, you know, technology really wasn't there. So we had to wait for a couple of items to actually happen in technology so we can end up with, you know, billions of IoT devices. The first thing we had to wait was, well, the name of IoT. The name of IoT actually came uh, from Kevin Ashton, and it was one of the, his presentations, and actually he called the IoT, the Internet of Things, and that kind of stick from that moment, really. So Kevin Ashton, I guess we say thank you for that. Uh, next thing we had to wait is the chips. Uh, I remember my first computer, uh, like 1990s. It was like 286, 386, 486. Those were okay common computers, but they were pretty expensive. And it wasn't really easy to kind of put those chips and buy them and you know in millions or billions of them so we had to wait for cpus to kind of uh go down and be more affordable and that really happened in 2010s i would say after that we had to wait uh one more thing which was the communication well you know you just cannot put a uh, cable to each iot devices right so we had to wait wi-fi to actually become a real common uh, communication and that's really in 2010s too and the last one we had to wait which was the turning point point for iot's is the ipv4 to ipv6 uh, evolution until then really we simply we did not have enough ip addresses for all those iot devices as you can see ipv4 the limit was 4.3 billion uh, IP addresses. With IPv6, we passed that. So that happened in 2011. That was the last turning point. You know, we had to wait for IoTs to actually just explode. Now, when I actually talk about 80s and 90s, the technology wasn't there, but the, that didn't really stop people. Here is the first IoT device you have. 
Uh, this happened in one university. It was 1982, and the students actually put sensors in this vending machine, and they connected into a local network, and they were able to actually see how many cocks are out there and what was their really the temperatures. They were able to check this with the computers. So that was really the first IoT device in 1982. Then uh, we had to wait eight more years for a device which actually connected uh, by the internet by using TCP IP. And here on this picture, you see John Ramke he connected his actually toaster to his computer by using the TCP IP uh, protocol. So really, the idea was uh, he actually connected by cables because, well, there was no Wi-Fi then. So you can see uh, some of those, you know, uh, cables out there connected uh, from the toaster. And really the idea was he was just putting a piece of uh, bread in the toaster and he was able to click on his uh, computer and the toaster was just taking the bread inside and you know keeping inside x amount of time which he could control that from his computer and then the toaster was you know just working and just give the toast back so that was really the first tcp ip device uh of internet that was 1990. then next year 1991 we actually see the first lab camera and that's really an interesting uh, story too and that was another university and the problem was coffee machine was getting empty and when people needed the coffee well they had to make the new copy so they say how are we gonna fix this problem what they did is they put that camera out there you see in the left corner and that camera was watching the coffee machine and it was taking a picture of coffee like three times, I believe three times a minute. And it was just sending to a, you know, address. The name of the application was X Coffee. And in this way, we, they were not, you know, out of coffee whenever they needed. So that was another uh, universal solution for us, which, well, bring the web cameras. Uh, so actually, you can see this in action. Believe it or not, here's a picture of it and here i can show you here let me find my pointer so this is our friend i don't know if you can see it but there is as you can see the the coffee machine is right here is watching this is the camera and this is the coffee machine so he was able to actually see if the coffee was empty or he had to go make more coffee so as you can see that's in action 1991. Now, uh, next one is actually, let me take myself out of here. So, this is the first internet connected refrigerator. Yes, was 2000. And as you can see, it, it's a pretty complex machine, and it could actually, you can watch TV on it, and there was an electronic pen on it. You can have some, uh, you can write data memories on it. You can even send video messages to people from the internet. So that was really pretty complex machine for 2000. And not many people needed that either. On top of that, as you can see the price of it, it was $20,000. There is no way I'm paying $20,000 for any refrigerator. So it failed. But... That happened in 2000, which was kind of crazy, if you ask me. Now, uh, I think you have uh, a good idea right now, I think, uh, about what a IoT device is, right? So really, it's just like a one board, and you have all kinds of sensors you can connect to that board, and you have one application running and getting that data from the sensors. And, well, from there, you can do whatever with it. Usually, you just share with something, right? So that is really what the IoT is. Uh, you can create all kinds of stuff with this. Very useful stuff and useful stuff. For example, 
you know, I have one in my actual wristband here, which actually watches my heart. And if I sit down here too much, it says that, you know, I should just, you know, stand up and do something. So it's useful. Uh, there are items like this, like there are doorbells, there's like thermostats, smart locks, and voice controllers. There's like speakers, you can even talk to them and they talk back to you and you can order things and all kind of stuff. Very useful. Also, there are useless stuff out there. For example, they have this smart fork. Uh, I guess I never seen one, but it, uh, it says that, you know, if you eat too fast, that thing starts to kind of shake and kind of tells you that you shouldn't eat that fast. I don't know about you, but that's the last thing I need, really, especially when I'm eating the food. Uh, there is a smart I guess, shirt or sweater, whatever. Uh, what it does is actually it listens what's really happening around you. And depending what's happening, there is a screen in front of you and it just sends messages. And there's another unit out there is for salt. Uh, it tries to keep, you know, control the salt, how much you use per day. There are much more than that when it comes to the useless, but I'm not going to be able to cover all of them. And some of them are really like adult too, which is some crazy stories out there about them. So now uh, let's look at some of the actually the numbers when it comes to the IoT. So this is from the IoT analytics and we are in 2021. And as you can see, the estimate is almost 24 billion IoT devices are on Earth right now. That's, that's a huge number. And they are expecting uh, in five years, next five years, that's going to actually double. There are a lot of projects going on out there, small and large, and businesses and governments love the IoT devices because, you know, they can do all kinds of stuff. Before before problem happens, IoT device can sense it and just kind of warn people. So people like it. Well, I'm not sure if people like it, businesses like it. So let's uh, look at some of those projects, for example, because if you're going to work on any of those IoT devices, probably it's, if it's going to be like a small application, it's going to be one of those uh, items. So those are the most uh, popular ones. As you can see, the biggest one is the smartphone. And, uh, you know, it's on smartphone, there's all kind of sensors on it. And we like it or not many applications like to share all kind of information on, on us too so that's probably one of the most common iot device that you can write an application for rather than that uh we have like smart speakers right you know you can talk to speaker and it can understand what you are saying and it can suggest and talk talk to you back and there's like streaming devices those are pretty popular so i guess if you're going to write any kind of applications, it might be one of those devices. If you're going to work on a more like a large scale, maybe industrial uh, application, probably it's going to be in one of those projects. Uh, the biggest one here is the smart city and smart cities are all over the place. And most of the big cities, you know, if I give an example, for example, uh, if you go to airport, you know, usually on the airports right now, most of the airports has those lights on the ceiling and shows that you know which spot is taken and which spot is available so if there's a sensor out there and if there's a car under that it just uh goes red and if there's no car under that it's you know uh green on top of that when you are you know usually they put those on the curves they say if you go this way there's like maybe 20 parking spots available don't go this way because well there's nothing out there so Really, the IoT devices are trying to find new parking spaces, which is great. That's one of the projects for Smart City. Uh, rather than that, you know, in the big cities, uh, most of the right now, the IoT is actually controlling all the traffic lights because it knows where the cars are coming from and it can see them. It can just change the lights and all kind of stuff with the Smart City uh, projects. Uh, rather than that, there's connected cars. Now they can actually drive themselves on top of that. They generate all kind of data, a lot of data. And you can you can create all kind of applications for them too. So those are some of the really the big, I guess, players when it comes to IoT uh, in large scale. 
when you work on the IoT, probably there are some couple of things that you kind of need to know before we continue uh, to Azure uh, features. The first thing you need to worry about is the connections, depending how much data you are trying to share. And what you are trying to do, you kind of need to pick some kind of connection, right? Because, well, you want your application online all the time. So, it, and you, that doesn't mean that you have to find the, you know, the most expensive one, but you want to find the most affordable connection because I don't know how many IoT devices you are going to end up with. So, the first uh, unit to think about is where your devices is. Your device is really remote. Like, for example, is it going to be on like a one container ship or is it going to be like on a plane, which is, you know, uh, flying all over the world and you might not have the Internet. So how are you going to share your uh, data? Right. Uh, if you are in that situation, then you really have uh, two options. The first one is it can be a cell phone or it can be a satellite. So by using the cell phone and satellite, you can really send data to anywhere. And you can send a lot of data too, but the problem is it's gonna probably you know cost you. That's kind of the most expensive uh, option here. Uh, and when you pick the cell phone or satellite, it really you are using you are consuming a lot of power, and because of that you can actually have a high range and high bandwidth. That's one of the main reasons probably you cannot actually work or with the battery. So you are gonna really need a constantly AC power. Uh, that's, I guess, the best example I can give you is your cell phone, right? Your cell phone uh, is a high range, it has a high bandwidth, but it consumes high power. That's why you have to go and charge it every day. So that's the first option. That's the most expensive option. And if you need more flexible or your, your uh, IoT device is not like remote like that, then you have different options. The second option you have is, well, you still want to send a lot of data, but the data uh, you're going to send is going to need less range because we are trying to kind of, I guess, to take the, keep the power down. If you need to keep the power down, then that means we have to keep the range down. Uh, there are three options for that. It can be a Bluetooth, it can be wireless, or it can be an Ethernet cable. Believe it or not, all of them are in the same category because all of them is range is limited. So that's the second option. It's much cheaper than a uh, satellite or the uh, cell phone option. So. You can put all your devices in one area, and as, as long as you have routers and they can connect to the router, you are good to go. You can send all kind of data. The third option. So if we want to actually send, if we want to keep the range high, then what we need to do is we have to get, get the bandwidth uh, down. To do that, uh, the power is going to be low and bandwidth is going to be low, but the range is going to be high. Believe it or not, there are a lot of IoT devices using this uh, option. And this option actually came in 2013. It called LPWAN, which is the Wall Power Wide Area Network. If you really think about it, most of the IoT devices do not really send that much data. For example, if you have a moisture sensor or if you are doing like a parking management, right? So your devices are not really sending that much data. They are just maybe getting figure out how much water uh, we got today and maybe send it every, I don't know, two or three hours to the source. All you are sending is the level of water in parking management. All you are sending is if there's a car here or not. Or, for example, those public and infrastructure lightings that you see outside, you know, they turn themselves on at night. They are the same way. Are you on or are you, you are off? You know, that that's all it sends. Or you have this power or water meters now. They are just putting them on the houses. They just send a number. So for those cases, you don't need a satellite. You don't need a Bluetooth. All you need is really just you're going to send a simple data. And you can use that with the LP band. And as I say before, there's a lot of IoT devices are using that, and it's newer. But 
there's a good amount of IoT devices out there for that. So that's an option. Uh, depending what type of application you are uh, developing, you just need to go with one of those. Now, uh, one of the big problems with IoT is the security. The main reason for that is, well, there are many of them out there, like the billions of IoT devices, and who's going to go and change their passwords, right? Depending on what type of application you have, you might need a connection string, you might need some kind of master key, you might need some passwords. So unfortunately, what developers do is they hard code those uh, passwords, or they just use the default passwords, because simply they don't have time to change them. If you want to change them, or if you want to enforce some kind of encryption on them, well, the problem is your device might not be strong enough to actually handle that. So you are kind of stuck with that too. So security is a really an issue with IoT devices. The biggest uh, example I can give you, which uh, in the United States we had this problem, hackers actually just hacked one of the you know pipeline systems here, and they were able to turn off all the pumps, so people were out of oil. So this is a great example when it comes to IoT, how IoT can change the life very easily uh, if somebody wrong gets the access. So. If you're a company, private company, or if you're a government, really, uh, security is a big thing to look at when it comes to IoTs. Now, I think we are in good shape to start to introduce uh, what is available uh, in Azure when it comes to the IoT. The first thing you need to know is the Azure IoT Hub. This is the location that all of your IoT devices are going to connect and send the messages. So that's going to be like a central hub for all of your IoT devices. You don't want to create your own data center for all the IoT devices you have because the scaling is going to be not easy. Today you might have 10,000 devices, next year you might have 1 million. Who's going to handle all this, you know, scaling up and buying servers and other stuff? You don't want to do that yourself. You need to pick some kind of cloud solution for that. And as you as the Azure IoT Hub. It's a reliable, and as I said before, it's scalable. So if you need more devices, you can just scale up. If you have less, you can go scale down. So it's much easier. Uh, and also there are some security out there because Azure has some you know, uh, security standards. And whenever you are sending messages or receiving messages, those has to met Azure's uh, security. So that, that helps you and gives you some peace out there too. So when it comes to the scaling, here is the numbers. So I'm using here the free edition. As you can see, uh, I have the total number. I can send 8,000 messages per day. And my message size can be half kilobytes, which is more than enough for me. Uh, but in the meantime, as you can see, really, it depends how much data you are sending and how big the you know, the document really depends on the price here. So you can scale up and scale down very easily by doing this. Now, uh, Azure IoT Hub is the first step. So Azure IoT Hub, you are going to send a message, message comes to Azure IoT Hub, then it. Well, Azure IoT Hub uh, can be the pipeline and it can you can connect to many other features of Azure, for example. We have event grid. Uh, event grid is you know enables your business to react quickly to critical events uh, in a reliable, scalable, and secure manner. You can use logic apps. Uh, Azure logic apps is mostly for automating your business processes. You can use uh, machine learning. Uh, you can add AI models to your applications to your IoT device, so it can actually make decisions itself. Uh, you can use stream analytics that is for mostly to run real-time analytics computations on the data streaming from your devices so you don't have to kind of save them somewhere to actually see what's happening you can see that in real time so you can really create a pipeline from azure iot hub to any of those applications there are much more than that those are just like the main ones i listed here but uh 
there are options and you can do all kind of stuff in Azure after you know you uh, send the message to Azure IoT Hub. The next thing we should, uh, I guess, to cover is Azure IoT Hub Edge. That's mostly for edging computers. And this can be a little bit confusing if this is the first time you know you are uh, hearing about the IoT Hub. Now, uh, really, the simple what we are really saying here is we are giving more responsibility to IoT devices by using the Hub Edge. So, for example, SQL Edge is a module which we want to push on the the IoT device, right? So when we do that, SQL Server can actually keep the data in the device and send them whenever we want to. So that is going to say that we don't need to, you know, like, I guess, send every message to Azure IoT Hub immediately. Or we can send, we can put some AI uh, modules and maybe our IoT device can actually make decisions itself. So whenever we lo lose the network, we might not send, I mean, lose the data or our IoT device might not be useless anymore because it cannot send the data to IoT Hub. So thanks to IoT Hub Edge, it's going to make less network calls and it's going to be more responsive because, well, it doesn't need to wait for a response from Azure IoT Hub to make something. And it's going to be very uh, reliable in the offline periods. Uh, we are going to be able to push applications to the, the IoT Hub Edge devices by containers. So you should be familiar with the containers, at least you should know how to list them, you know how to run them. So all of those are going to actually happen, uh, including SQL Edge uh, with containers. I think we are in good shape to introduce SQL Edge. So SQL Edge, if you look at the documentation, uh, it says it's the latest version, latest version of SQL Server. So right now it's 2019 on Linux is the latest one so that might change later uh, microsoft suggests that you should have ubuntu 1804 uh, that's the recommended operation system you should have in your device and azure sql edge does not come with all other features that you know usual sql server comes with like for example ssis ssrs analyst services and all that stuff they are not there uh, I will say 90% of database engine is there. There are some couple of things is missing, but most of the database engine uh, is in the Azure SQL Edge. To make it work, uh, you are going to need a 64-bit processor. And until you know now, it was X64 was the only one. Uh, and Microsoft actually had the ARM64, and that's opened this whole IoT uh, devices to the SQL. Uh, you are going to need at least one CPU and minimum you need a one gig RAM, but probably one gig RAM is not going to cut it. So it really depends what you are trying to, you know, what you're going to try to do with this device. I will suggest at least, you know, you should have four gig RAM, which is easier to say if you have one device. But if you have one million device, then, you know, that can get kind of tricky. Uh, whenever SQL Edge actually starts up, the minimum memory it's going to have is the 450 megabytes. So if you have one gig RAM, half is already gone to the SQL Edge just, you know, running. So you should kind of like watch how much RAM you're going to need for sure. Uh, as I said before, SQL Edge is coming, but it's not coming with many features. But it's coming with three things that any other SQL Server versions does not have. The first one is the SQL streaming. And SQL streaming is really based on the same engine that I just talked about, the Azure Stream Analytics. It just provides real-time data streaming capabilities uh, in Azure SQL Edge. The next one is the date bucket T-SQL function. And that's mostly for calling the date bucket for time series data analytics. And the last one is the Onyx runtime. Onyx stands for Open Neutral Network Exchange. And 
you are able to add you know machine learning capabilities through the onyx uh, runtime and it's it's there for the sql edge that you can use when it comes to the price if you go pay as you go uh it's ten dollar per device per month and if you are going to have reserve options it can be 100 or 60 dollar per device per year depending you know how many years you actually use uh to register so that is the sql edge now uh sql edge is great and I guess let's talk about the IOTs first. So IOTs are just like, uh, really like a babies. Babies, to communicate, they cry constantly. They're happy or they're not happy. That's the way that they communicate. Uh, IOT devices, for them communication, they just constantly send messages uh, and creating a lot of data. Now, uh, really Azure SQL Edge works like a pacifier. If you really think about it because you put this database in the uh, your application and whenever it tries to communicate now you have the sql edge out there waiting so rather than just pushing the data to azure iot hub you can actually save it on your uh, sql edge right so it really works like a pacifier and it gives you some kind of break and you don't lose anymore you know if you lose a network and anything like that you can just save your data in your sql edge when the network comes back you can send it back to azure iot hub so there are two pacifiers the first one is a developer version which is free and it supports up to 32 gig memory and four uh, cores of cpu the production version uh, supports up to 64 gig memory and eight cores of CPU. So what do we need to do to actually install SQL Edge to uh, our devices? The first thing we are gonna need is the IoT Edge runtime. We have to install that to our device. And this runtime is gonna actually the one which is going to register our device and our device is going to able to connect to Azure and it's going to have all the standards that Azure requires and it's going to it's going to be in the middle it's going to be the middleman really between the Azure and the IoT uh, application so really Edge runtime is going to you know install any kind of updates or workloads so you can send uh, messages to your device from the Azure IoT uh, up and edge runtime will get that message and do what it needs to do as i said before everything is going to be in modules including sql edge so you can send all kind of modules from iot hub to your devices and iot edge runtime is the one which is going to download what you are trying to install and push the configuration on it it's going to send all the report module health back to Azure IoT Hub so you can see which devices are working, which devices are having problems easily. And it's just going to really manage all the communications uh, of between, between Azure and the IoT device. Azure IoT Hub, the IoT Edge uh, runtime has two parts. The first part is IoT Edge agent. That is mostly for the modules. As I said before, whenever you send the modules, it's going to handle all the modules and it's going to send back the steps of your uh, modules and your applications and your device. The second one is the IoT Edge Hub. So really that's the proxy of the Azure IoT Hub and your application thinks that it's connecting to Azure IoT Hub when it's actually connecting to local version. So it's going to be able to uh, go much faster and be able to survive when the network is down. In the meantime, it's going to be you know, responsible with the communication between real Azure IoT Hub and the local version. So those are the two modules that we need to run to make our applications, uh, to make our IoT actually uh, communicate to Azure. All right, next. Actually, this is my Raspberry Pi's picture when I bought it almost two years ago. And as you can see, there's not really that much going on. There's a couple of uh, boxes, but when I open them, it's just like a really small box. But you can do all kinds of stuff. Look at its uh, specifications. 
it has a good CPU, 64 bit CPU. I bought the 4 gig uh, version when it comes to the RAM, but it has a Wi Fi, it can connect 2.4 or 5 gig, and it has internet, four USB ports, it has two HDMI ports, believe it or not, so you can actually connect two uh, monitors on it. And it supports display port, camera port, uh, it has audio port, it comes with the micro SD card, so you can have all kind of storage on that. And my version came with the Debian uh, Linux 10 based uh, operation system. So I got this, but the problem was I wasn't really like a Linux person. I have been doing everything in Windows, so it was a challenge to actually configure that and be able to remote in and do things. So from now uh, to the end of this presentation, I'm going to actually show you how I did it and step by step uh, what problems I had. The first thing, my first problem was I really didn't want to waste one of my monitors for this small box. So I say, why don't I just put this on uh, on my you know network, put it on the router, connect it on the my uh, net network, and I can connect remotely. So that sounds great, but I did not have any kind of experience how to remote in to uh, the Linux before. So to do that, we need to use to open SSH. Open SSH really encrypts all the traffic and it's pretty secure. And that's how we are going to actually remote into the Linux uh, device. In my case, that's going to be Raspberry Pi. Uh, well, rather than you know uh, using this open, open SSH, there are some other third party tools you can download if you like but i went with this one because actually you can install this very easily by using the powershell from the windows to do that i just open the powershell and as you can see i use the add windows capability uh, and i just give the open ssh client and that should be really the enough for what we are trying to do. I just showed the server here. I'm just showing it's there, but we are not going to use that. So by just doing that, you are really downloading the OpenSSH client and you are just setting it up. Uh, when this is completed, we need to do a couple of other things. The first thing we had to do is we want to start the service and the service is SSHD, but we don't want to do that every time right we want that thing to actually start automatically to do that i use the set service and i say the startup type automatic so from that point it just got started itself also you want to check your firewall uh you don't want that thing to be behind the firewall so you won't kind of uh, i guess uh, kill yourself and try to figure out why it's not connecting so it's good to check to get net uh, firewall rule for ssh and it looks like I am in good shape here. Nothing is getting blocked, so I'm good. So from this point, I am actually ready to use uh, SSH to remote in my device. As you can see here, what I'm doing here is uh, I gave the username, which is pi, at the IP address of my device. And if you have the right username and right password, it's going to ask you the password here. You're going to type the password, then uh, I'm in actually in Pi, Raspberry Pi, and all the comments that I'm going to actually write here is going to actually run in my Raspberry Pi, not on my computer anymore. So, so far, I'm good. Actually, I remote in. I am ready to set up my device. Now, next, I want to speak about the one more thing here because I have some couple I have a couple of problems with this in older days we had 32 bit uh, CPUs then 64 bit came and sometimes we found ourselves that we had a 64 bit application but our uh, computer was 32 bit and when you try to run it it didn't run right it gave you a problem so we have the same problem here but actually the problem got a little bit bigger because now we have 
regular 32-bit and 64-bit CPUs. On top of that, we have 32-bit ARM CPUs and 64-bit ARM CPUs. So the, we have more options. So whenever you are downloading something, you want to be sure that you are picking the right CPU architecture. If you don't, well, I'm saying that because it happened to me, if you don't, it's not going to give you a very friendly error and say that, you know what, you are trying with the, you know, this application is for 64-bit, but you are running uh, ARM 32-bit, so please go and, you know, install the right one. Yeah, I wish it was like that. It's not going to give you an error like that. And because of that, you are going to waste a lot of time to figure out what is really the problem. I know it because it happened to me. So whenever you are downloading any kind of files, be sure it's for your CPU. And the second thing uh, I will suggest is, as I said before, everything is in modules and everything is in containers. So you should be familiar with some of the content. You don't have to be pro about the containers, but you should know, I guess, how to start them and how to list them. So you should know some about the containers. Other thing I did not know is there are actually two tiers when it comes to the support of those uh, operation systems. So the tier one, which is really the full support from the Microsoft, as you can see, Ubuntu Server 1804 is uh, here and it's fully supported. Now, as I said before, if I if you remember, my device actually did not come with Ubuntu. It came with Debian. Uh, I don't even remember the version right now. So when I actually see the Ubuntu, I was like, well, you know, I'm not going to even worry about really configuring that. I'm going to go and get Ubuntu and then I will start again. So I went to the Ubuntu and I get, I you know, I try to get the latest version. Why not, right? But the latest version wasn't 1804. The La latest version was 2004, like two years ago. I don't even know what it is now. So I get the latest version. I was like, well, why do I need the 1804, right? So I will get the latest version. The problem is now I'm in trouble because 2004 is actually not in tier one support. Tier one support, uh, Microsoft is fully tested. Everything is working. They have all the scripts, all the manuals, all the everything. They just, you just have to run a couple of comments and your device is ready. I'm not in that case. So my device is actually in here in tier two support. As you can see, there's many other operation systems. What really tier two is telling you is Microsoft knows it works in any of those operation systems that you see here. But they are not giving you a manual. They are not giving you a documentation. They are not giving you why is it might not be working or what type of problems you are going to see. And also the, the most important one is the repositories, which actually tells you where the files are. You don't have them. So you have to actually do everything yourself if you are in tier two support here. The only thing, Microsoft tells you is it works, but you're in your own. And I was in this uh, tier two support. So I'm going to actually show you how to install it in tier one and tier two. So uh, no worries, I guess. The first one, uh, this is for the tier one. So what we had to do first is we had to actually download the repository file which uh, if it's for Ubuntu server, as you can see, I am using the CURL. If you don't know what CURL is, it stands for client URL, and you can use it to download files from internet. And it supports all kind of uh, protocols. So in this case, I am downloading this file, prod.list, and as you can see, it's for Ubuntu 18.04 to my local for folder and I name it as Microsoft Prod List. This file has all the repositories. When I say repository, just really whenever it comes to the point that you are ready to actually install the IoT Edge, all you have to do is 
install say IoT install IoT Edge, and since if the we are going to register this uh, repository, your Linux is going to know where IoT Edge is, so it can download it and it can install it for you. So that's what the repository files are. And so we are going to download this file to the local uh, folder. Then I am going to actually copy this folder from this place to other repositories in Linux. And in Linux, this is a special folder for other sources. So whenever you type something, you try to install something, this is the place that uh, Linux is going to look at. Uh, if you don't know what sudo is, uh, sudo is almost like run as admin. And I believe this is in Linux super user do. I think that's what sudo is uh, standing out there for. So, but really, it's just you are saying run as admin. So, so far, we got the file which has the repositories and we registered it in the Linux uh, by just copying the sources.list.d uh, directory. Next, uh, this one is going to actually apply for tier one or tier two. You have to do this part. This one is going to, for the pretty good privacy uh, public key, uh, it's going to need for the encryption program uh, for Azure. So as you can see, I'm still using the CURL here. I am downloading the uh, file and I'm putting in this uh, location. Then. Just like the other file, I am actually putting this in a different folder that all the uh, PGP actual files are in here. So you have to kind of copy it here after you uh, download it. So this applies to tier one or tier two. Now, uh, next, this one applies to tier one and tier two too. So as I said before, all the uh, applications are going to be in containers, so you need some kind of container system. Uh, and Microsoft actually suggested the Mobi engine. Uh, Docker works too, but Mob Mobi engine is the pick for this one. So as you can see, I am using uh, AppCat. AppCat is like for application package tool. And I'm getting the latest version of it. Then I'm installing the Mobi engine here. And after that is uh, completed, I am going to get this config file, which is going to actually configure the Mobi engine for me. And after that, I'm going to run that uh, file and kind of be done with the uh, container configuration by doing this. As I said before, this applies to tier one and tier two. Uh, now, uh, if you're in tier one, you are almost there. All you have to do is you have to go and use the app get and you're going to say install IoT Edge. When you run that, Linux is going to actually find the IoT Edge because we download that file, repository file from Microsoft, and Microsoft is going to tell where IoT Edge is, what needs to get downloaded. So everything's going to happen magically in the back end. And well, your device is going to have the runtime, which is going to uh, connect to Azure well, for um, your IoT. So everything is going to work if you your operational system is in tier one. Well, unfortunately, that didn't work for me. When I run that, Linux say that I have no idea what IoT Edge is. I don't know what we are trying to do. So then I was lost. So I had to start to actually figure out, okay, what is next? Uh, before I show you the tier two, uh, by I just put this as a reference here, so you can actually use different version of IoT Edge if you like to to your device if you are in tier one just like this. Now, I guess the fun starts now. Tier two. The first thing I have to do is I need to figure it out. Okay, what is really happening? Why this thing is not working? So. After some kind of research, I figure out that uh, the IoT Edge runtime depends on this file here, which is the lib SSL 1.0.0 file. This file actually makes SSL available in Ubuntu Linux, which is pretty important. 
but I couldn't figure out, okay, if this is that important, why the 2004 does not have it. It ended up 2004. 2004 has it, but Linux actually upgraded this file. So the file name is not 1.0.0 anymore. It's, I think it was lib SSL 1.10. Because of that, IoT Edge fails because it is looking for this file. So I had to actually go and find this file first. This is the place when I say the CPU is important. You kind of need to know what kind of CPU you have your device. As you can see, those are the same file. If you can see at the end of the files, it kind of tells you what kind of CPU is for. And the first time I came, I downloaded the wrong one. And when I, because of that, it didn't want to work and it took for, well, one or two days to figure this out. Actually, I downloaded the wrong one because the, really the error is not that useful. So in my case, as you can see, I am downloading the ARM64 here. And to do that, I am still using the C URL. I am putting my uh, you know, URL here and I'm saving it as test.deb. DEB is, uh, I need to unextract it. It's just like zip file. So as you can see, I'm saying run as admin. I'm using the dip package. That's going to actually depackage the uh, file. And this is the file that I just downloaded here. When it's completed, I'm going to actually install the libssl. To do that, as you can see, I'm using the apt get again. And I'm saying install libssl. 100. That's the one that I just downloaded. So in now I have the file that actually uh, runtime requires. So I should be able to install the IoT Edge now, right? But the problem is I don't know where IoT Edge is. So I have to go and find it. IoT Edge is actually in the GitHub. So you can actually go and find it. Then I prepare this one. That was the latest version. I'm sure that version is higher now. So I downloaded the latest one from here again by using the CURL. After I download by the CURL, I was ready to actually install with the sudo apt-get and IoT Edge. This time it didn't give me any errors. It says, all right, here we go. And it started. So from here, this is going to install because if you see the screen, I don't, I mean, I installed this many times, so I never had a problem. If you can start here, it ends fine. So after it ends, we still need to do a couple of steps uh, before we able to actually communicate with the Azure. The first thing uh, we have to do after it's completed is we have to register our device. Uh, you have to register your device to get actually connection string. There are three ways to do that. The first way is Azure Portal. You can do manually from there. If you like to use VS Code, you can actually download the IoT Tools extension and you can register by using the VS Code. Or you can get the latest version of the IoT extension for Azure CLI and you can do with the CLI, Azure CLI if you like. So in this uh, presentation, I'm going to show you the Azure Portal. Now, the other thing we have to decide is how are we going to actually authenticate? So there are two ways for that. Uh, the first one is the symmetric key. And the symmetric key is almost like the connection string. Like So you can get the connection string from the uh, Azure IoT Hub and just paste it to your uh, configuration file. You're good to go. If this works great for dev, uh, Nothing stops you, to, I guess, in production. But if you want to be more secured, uh, you can get the X549 certificate authentication. That may be more, I guess, uh, good for the production version. So in my case, I'm going to go with symmetric key because it's just for demo and it's much easier. Now, uh, so what to register our device? First, we have to go to Azure and start an Azure IoT Hub. Uh, if you don't have it, it's Pretty easy. It's just going to ask you a subscription. And really, probably the only thing it's going to ask you is the, what is the name of it? So I think I gave Sovran Web IoT for mine. The rest of them, I just keep it as it is. And I end up with an Azure IoT Hub. 
so after it's created, that service is created, you are going to actually go and click on add an IoT Edge device. Uh, thing you have to kind of pay attention here is it needs to be under IoT Edge here, in here, and then you're going to click on the add uh, an IoT Edge device here. When you click here, we are going to have a new window is going to come from the right side and it's going to really ask you what is the name of the device. You can give any kind of name. I'm going to give RASP4 to my device. This is the authentication type that I just talked about. Uh, I'm keeping the symmetric key because it's much easier uh, for this. And really from there, I'm just going to click uh, save and this is going to create my device and I name it as RASP4. When it's created, you will see the device. And as you can see, you click on the RASP4 in my case, and I'm gonna go and get my connection string from here. I am gonna copy it from here. Then I'm ready to actually go back and paste this to my device's configuration. To do that, I need to run. It's an application just like a Notepad, Nano. That's what uh, is in Linux. So I'm saying run as admin, Nano, and open this config file. Then I have to go back and find that area. Uh, it says for my manual provision and configuration. And I just paste my connection string here. And from here, I just need to save the file. Then I should be in good shape to actually handshake with Azure and be able to connect Azure IoT Hub. After you save it, you want to just restart your IoT Edge by using the following uh, the comment here, the run as systemctl restart IoT Edge. This is going to actually restart your IoT Edge application. Then I'm going to check the status of IoT Edge. And this is going to tell me if I'm actually connecting to Azure or I'm having issues. So when I actually type that, this is how it's going to look like both way. For you too. So as you can see, I restart the IoT Edge and I say check the IoT Edge. Then you can actually see everything is okay. I am handshaking okay. All the protocols are fine, which means that I'm actually connecting to Azure right now. So nothing is stopping me right now to actually push some modules on my IoT device. In my case, it's going to be SQL Edge. So, believe it or not, 55 minutes passed. Now we are ready to actually install the SQL Edge. All right. So, to do that, we go back to Azure IoT Hub. And what we are going to do here is we are going to again open our device. In my case, it was RASP4. And I'm going to click on Set Modules here. When I click on that, uh, you are going to go to in a different page. Then it's going to ask you, OK, where are your modules? So I'm going to click Add. SQL uh, Edge is under the Marketplace marketplace module. So I'm going to click that. Uh, then a window is going to fly from the right side. And I'm going to search for SQL. I'm picking the Azure SQL Edge developer, which is the free version. Uh, when I select that, then I'm going to end up in this page. So this page might look familiar if you know about the containers. This is really the place that this is the configuration we are going to try to push on our uh, device. So we know it's going to be SQL Edge, but we still need to kind of at least give some kind of SA password. So when actually comes, you know, SQL Edge comes up we can connect it by using this password. And also we kind of need to accept this EULI here. As you can see, there's like two sets here. The first one is the desired value, which this is the one that we are pushing. And this is the one that this is going to get reported after SQL is started. So they kind of have to match. If they don't match, we know that there's some kind of problem out there. So after I give the password here, I am actually ready to push this to my device. So when I push this, this on, on my device, I am not going to send 
SQL Edge module to the device. I'm just going to give the information so my actually is, uh, IoT device can get the information and download it, then configure it itself. So this might take some time because it needs to download the files and it needs to configure it. So it, depending on your network, it might take really the speed, five, 10 minutes. And when that's completed, you can actually go back to your IoT device and you can use this IoT Edge list, which is going to actually list all the containers you have. As you can see, we have Edge Agent and Edge Hub. Those are always there. But you can see I have the Azure SQL Edge. It's running. And that's where the configuration is coming from. If you see everything is running, you are good. You are able to now actually connect to your SQL Edge. Now, actually, let's try to connect uh my one here so to do that let me go back to management studio so well, let me open it here so what i need to do here is i'm just gonna just by connecting any other sql server i'm gonna click database engine this is the ip address of my uh, raspberry pi and this is the same username and password I gave in Azure IoT Hub. When I connected, as you can see, I connected to my Raspberry Pi. Now I can do all kind of stuff here. And as you can see, there are databases here. You can create a new database. Let's see. I'm just going to call this probably sensors and save it so this is going to create a database in my raspberry pi and let's say we have all kind of sensors in our raspberry pi and we want to save all the sensors information here so we have the database from here really as you can see we have tables and i can create new table here to store data it has even graph tables as you can see so what i'm going to do here is I'm going to just create a simple table. So let's say create table. Let's say maybe we have O2 sensor, right? And we are going to say maybe I'm just making this up right now on fly. So let's say O2 ID. Let's see, this is integer. And what else we can say? Received date. That can be maybe date time. And you can maybe add all two values. And let's make this one time. Thanks. Yes, there we go. We have the table. And let's run this and show you actually it works. We are in Raspberry Pi creating a table. And there it is. We have our table. If I refresh it, I should be able to see it. Here's my all two sensor. It's ready to actually receive data. So you can have all kind of applications running and getting the sensor and pushing it here. So as you can see, we can save the data in our IoT device now. All right. So that was my adventure. And I hope everybody learned something new today. And I enjoy to be with you today. And I hope uh, everybody enjoyed it. Uh, you know, it's kind of stuck here, sorry. All right, thank you. And I can take any of your questions uh, now, or if you have other questions later, please uh, join me from the LinkedIn or Twitter. I'll be always there. I can get any of your questions anytime and check my blog again. And thank you again to uh, Data Platform team for taking me as a speaker and thank you our sponsors especially the Microsoft and please don't forget to get you can get some prizes so please check out the uh, following information thank you again for joining me today and have a nice day mm -hmm.